Isn't it good when God just shows up and does what you don't expect? Um, so I'd love to read you a little bit um, from the Bible and um, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about myself because we've only just met. And then um, I just want to share what I feel that God has kind of put on uh, my heart uh, for you tonight. So um, you don't need to look it up, just listen. It's from Numbers chapter 13. Many of you will know it well. So just to set this passage in context, what happened is Moses has led uh, the people of God, and they're, on the, they're, in the, they're in the desert of Paran. They're right on the border of the promised land. And uh, what he does, he sends out spies and says, go and look at the land, see what the land's like, then come and give us a report of the land that, that God is giving us. And uh, this is what happens. So Numbers 13, starting at verse 26. They came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. There they reported to them, and to the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here's the fruit. But the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. We saw descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites live in the Negev. The Hittites, Jebusites, and Amorites live in the hill country, and the Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, we should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. So I wasn't brought up in a Christian family. Um, uh, um, my father died when I was three of lung cancer. And um, in fact, the, my father, his cousin, was um, somebody who um, was a very well-known sort of Christian uh, leader in, the, in this country. And uh, my father had grown up with him. And when my father was ill, my mother wrote to this uh, man and said, um, Christopher, that's my father, he's not very well, um, he's dying, he'd love to see you. And uh, this leader wrote back and said, I'm so sorry to hear that, and I'm really busy, so here's a prayer. And so you can imagine that, that uh, I was brought up in a household where, where uh, Jesus and church was not something that was met with universal uh, approval. And my mum had been really hurt. By, uh, by the response, and I totally understand it. He probably was really busy and hadn't seen each other for a long time. So, so anyway, th then what happened is when I was 16 or 15 years old, these four beautiful girls moved two doors down from where I was living in London. The youngest one was um, within striking distance of my age, um, and she was pretty hot. And so I spent um, quite a long time trying to persuade her to go on a date with me, and, and she, she didn't ever say no because she was far too nice, but, but the date never quite happened, and the thing is, as I spent more time with them, what I discovered, there was something about them that was just different. Have you ever met people and they've got this kind of quality about them? It's not just their charismatic personalities, there's just something about them that is different and is really compelling and intriguing, and, and I, I, my mom and I and my brother, we just could not work out what it was. At all, and then they just kind of casually dropped into conversation that they were Christians, and I was really confused because I'd never met a, 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 an interesting Christian, <laughs> I'd never met a Christian uh, who was my age, and I'd never met an, a, a Christian who was attractive, like you know, and this was like one attractive Christian, and um, and I, it got to the stage having sort of tried various times to uh, get her to come on a date with me. Uh, that, that eventually, um, I don't know if you've ever had this, when you hear a voice that sounds alarmingly like yours, committing to do something you really don't want to do. Have you ever been there? Have you ever done that? So what happened was I just heard this voice say, I'll come to church. And the problem is, once it's out there, you can't take it back. And, and I was sort of sufficiently desperate. And I'm, a, I'm you know, um, I'm 41 years old, nearly 42. Uh, I'm secure enough to admit that I was desperate. And I was desperate. Um, that, that I figured I could sit through an hour or so in a cold church with next to nobody else if it meant that I could sort of sit next to her and you know, maybe we could go out after church, that kind of thing. And, um, and so um, long story short, um, you know, I went to church. It was totally not like anything I'd experienced before in my life. Uh, we kind of went, and there were loads of people my age. It was packed. Uh, they were all worshiping Jesus. I sort of, it kind of reminded me a little bit um, of kind of window cleaning, you know, kind of, or sort of wax on, wax off, if you're into the karate kid sort of thing. Um, but it was, it was um, there was something about the way that they talked about Jesus. 
they talked about Jesus like he's a real person. I, I'd only ever heard people talk about Jesus like he was some person out of a history book, possibly. And these people talked about Jesus like he was a real person. They talked about Jesus like he was their friend. And it was really compelling and intriguing. And, and, and the thing about these people were that they were different from other people that I'd met. You know, normally what happens if you're in a group of people and, uh, say, for example, James, James is in the conversation, he leaves. That once James is gone, you know, kind of people would normally say what they really thought about him. Uh, and it, it would normally not be very nice. But what I, what I found with these group of people, that's not the case with you, James, I was just using you as an example. Um, but what I noticed is that these people, what would happen if, J, if James had been in the conversation and James left, they would then say even nicer things about James after he'd gone than they had when he was there. I was just totally not used to this kind of way of relating to people. Uh, and then they started talking about the Alpha course, and eventually I went on the Alpha course. And what happened on the Alpha course was... I encountered the person of Jesus, this person that I'd read about, that I'd learned about at school, that I really wasn't very interested in. I encountered him, and I was changed by him. And I remember the first time I got prayed for, I was filled with the Spirit on an alpha weekend. It just completely changed the course of my life. And the thing about these people were that they were hungry for Jesus. They were expectant. They expected him to show up when they prayed. They expected him to answer prayers when they prayed. They had this passion and this hunger for him. And not just that, but they had a hunger and expectation that he would use them to reach other people, to share uh, him with other people. And so that has kind of been part of my, sort of encoded into my DNA uh, since I was 16 years old. And I've grown up always with this, with this encouragement to be hungry for Jesus. Um, I remember in 1994, just these extraordinary times where God showed up in such power. It, you know, you'd leave church and there would be bodies everywhere, not just, not just in the building, but in the car park as well. The Holy Spirit just showed up and just people encountered him in ways that took them out, uh, frankly. And the thing is, what I've found is that when you've encountered Jesus, you will never settle for a substitute again. When you've tasted the real thing, you will never settle for less. Uh, once you've tasted real, fresh ground coffee, you will never settle for instant coffee again. I'm told. I don't drink coffee. I drink tea. Uh, but I'm told. Uh, my wife told me that I needed to add that into the talk that she told me. And since then, I've always been looking around to try and find and see what God is doing, who God's doing it with, and, and I've just wanted to be kind of around those kind of people, because I found the more time I spent around people like that, the hungrier for Jesus um, I've become. Now, I want to be honest, there have been times when I haven't felt particularly hungry. Uh, sometimes that's been because I've got busy. Sometimes it's because I've just felt pretty pleased with where I was. And because of that, what happens is the hunger has started to recede. And what I'm learning is the more of him that I have, the hungrier I become. You know, normally when you eat, you get to a point and you feel full and you don't want any more. Well, the reverse is true of Jesus. The more of him you have, the more of him you want. The less of him you have, the less of him you want. So if you're here and you're, you're not feeling hungry... How can you get hungry again? I just want to give you a couple of tips before I carry on. The first is spend time with him. There is no substitute for spending time in the presence of Jesus. I know it's one of your kind of core values, but spend time in the presence of Jesus, particularly in worship. Something happens when we worship Jesus and we, we spend so much of our time, so think about me or think about us or you know, our world and our thing. And when we focus on Jesus, he loves it and he releases his presence in a very particular way. And, we, and if, we, if we give him the time and the space, he will come and meet with us. Spend time with people who are where you want to be. I, 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 it was the best advice. I remember hearing that when I was about 17 years old. I've been a Christian uh, for, for just over a year. And someone said, if you want to stay hungry and if you want God to use you, hang around with people who are hungry for Jesus and who are being used by him. 
So that's what I did. I just, and it's, since then, I just spent my life looking for people who are hungry for Jesus and basically just trying to step into their slip, slipstream, learn what I can, uh, feed off their hunger, and get hungry again. Read or listen to stories of what God is doing. Until you come to that place where you can say in your heart, you know, all I want is more of him. Where you say, I don't want to settle for less than all the promises he has for me. God has promised immeasurably more. And it's amazing, isn't it, how easy we settle for something less than that. I want to know his presence more in my life. I want to hear his voice more clearly. I want to grow in deeper friendship with him. I listened to this talk. I remember I was probably about 19 years old. This guy called Brent Rue um, came and gave this talk all about friendship with Jesus. And he, he talked about going for a run with Jesus. He talked about having breakfast with Jesus. And I, frankly, at the time, I just wondered what on earth he was going on about. Um, but there was something compelling about what he is saying. And so I just thought, right, I'm going to try doing this. So when I had Brent, morning Jesus, I'd wake up, morning Jesus, go for a run, let's go for a run, Jesus. And I found that as I did that, I became aware of him in those moments. And that's not to say that I felt him all the time, but I just taught myself to become aware of him, of his presence, that he's not just interested in the hour and a half that I'm at church, but he wants to walk through the day with me. He's got a view on some of the things that I, that I do. He's got a view of, on, on some of the people that I hang out with, and he wants to share his heart. What I'm learning is that God loves us so much that he will lead us to places where we are just desperate and hungry and longing uh, for more of him. Where it is, the thought of not having him is so painful, you will pay whatever price it is in order to have more of him. I remember, I'm a part of 24-7 prayer now, and I remember I was at this uh, um, conference, this 24-7 prayer conference, this is before I was kind of involved with them in the way that I am now. And I remember being in this church, and I was standing, I was up in the balcony, and this worship was going on, and I felt like all my Christmases had come at once. Kind of everything that I love about when the people of God get together, you know, it's kind of crazy, insane, wild worship. The prophetic was kicking off. The Holy Spirit was moving. You know, the whole thing was going just crazy. And I remember just saying, uh, God, I, I just want to be, I, I will do whatever it takes to be part of what you're doing with 24-7. I will, I will do whatever it takes. Now, I didn't realize at the time that that would mean that I would, I would move job, I would move house, I'd pull my children out of school and we'd move town. But that is what happens. But I wouldn't change it. Because when you have encountered God like that, you just want to be around that. You want to be a part of that. I would not change any of it. And you know, what struck me when I started, uh, when God started speaking to me first about you guys here at Trinity, was that you had that same DNA, that same hunger for more of God, that longing to kind of take the land like Caleb in the, in the passage we just read, to, that, that desire to step into his presence, the emphasis on the presence of God. And the more I pray, the more I feel that the call and positioning of Trinity is going to be far more significant than you realize. I went for a walk on Friday, and uh, I walked out the door, and God just ambushed me and started sharing his heart about all of you. And I'm walking down the street, and I'm just weeping as he's sharing his heart ab about you. I just was so not expecting that. And there's something quite humbling and humiliating and amazing about when God just shows up, and you're walking down the street, and people are wondering, is he okay? What's going on with him? And, you know, God was just releasing his heart. Do you realize how close to his heart you are as a community? Do you realize? Do you realize how much he loves the way that you're pressing into him? How much he, he loves the way that you're grabbing hold of this new season that he's inviting you into? Do you realize how strategically he's placed you both in terms of the relational network you're in, but also geographically? Do you realize the care that he's taken to get you ready for what he's calling you into? Look at what he's doing in your midst. Look at what happens when you worship. Look what happens when you pray for people. Look at what he is doing in your student ministry. Look at what he's doing through Converge. I really believe that that it's about to sort of colloquially go global. 
this student thing is going to kind of catch people's imagination and take off. Look what he did at Splendor. Look what he's doing through the third person conferences. It's so easy when you're a part of something the whole time to miss how profound and how special and how precious it is when God is at work uh, amongst you. And as somebody who has kind of observed you from a distance, um, it's just been amazing like, and, uh, to hear God's heart and how much he loves all this stuff and, and the way that you're willing to partner with him. I just, I just want you to know that it's far more unusual than you realize. Normally what happens is, is churches have a plan and have an agenda and they stick to it. And what, what, one of the things God said he loved about this place was that you're just prepared to throw the agenda out the window. That is a special and a precious thing. Don't ever take that for granted. Look at the way that new wine is woven into the fabric of who you were and the tapestry of who you're becoming. That's really important. That you can be like a full expression of what new wine looks like. When people say, well, what does new wine look like in the context of a local church? You can say, well, come to our church and you can see. This is what new wine looks like, kind of lived out amongst the community people all the time. Do you realize what an honor it is that he's trusted you as a church with Mark and Karen Bailey? Do you realize? Because... I want to tell you something. And I I know we've only just met, uh, but this is really important. God has spoken to me about Mark and Karen Bailey more than almost any other church leader that I know. Long before I met them, long before I had interacted with them, God just started talking to me about this couple in Cheltenham. That he loved the way that they chased after him, how they modeled that to a church who had a hidden life in him that was authentic who are more concerned with God's reputation, with his reputation, than they were with their own, who were so sold out for him that they would champion other people, even when it was in other ministries, even when it came at a cost to them. That is precious to God's heart, that, that Mark and Karen are like that. When they've chosen to have a back seat so that other people can advance when they've chosen to pay that price. And God just saying how much he loved that, how much he's honoring that. And what you are seeing as a church, what they are seeing in their own life and ministry is a result of their decisions and their choices that are so often none of you even, none of us are aware of. But God sees it all. He, He said to me recently, he said, you know, they are held in high esteem in heaven. I'm proud to be seen with them. They're my friends. And I want you to know, that's not, you know, God has never said anything like that to me about anybody else. So I want to honor him, Mark, and I want to honor Karen. You need to realize how lucky you are as a church. And you need to look after them and you need to watch their backs. So I want to encourage you as a church, expect God to show up more powerfully. Expect to know greater intimacy with him. He's promised it. I no longer call you servants. Instead, I've called you friends. Expect to hear God's voice like you've never heard it before. Jeremiah 15, 15, come to me, and I'll show you great and unsearchable things which you do not know. Expect the manifest presence of God in ways that you haven't encountered before. Expect the miraculous. Expect more people coming to faith. It's not presumptuous. That's what he has promised. Don't take my word for it. It's all in the book. All of it. And understand what God is inviting you to. Because God's inviting you, I believe, to more of him. I just want to link this all to the passage. So the people of God are the, are the edge of the promised land. They're on the edge of the promise. And it's right there in front of them just waiting for them to take hold of it, to have the courage to believe that God's who he says he is, that he'll do what he said he'd do, and to step in, uh, into it and to take hold of what he's promised them. You know, and at that moment, this decisive moment, what happened is with, with two exceptions. Uh, they looked around, they looked at the enemy, and they said, we can't do this. 
They faltered. They were so close to everything that God had for them. And they faltered. They said, it's too hard. It's going to require more of us than we're willing to give. It's too hard. We'd rather stay where we are. You know, the desert prans, not too bad. Okay, it's not the promised land, but it's not that bad either. You know, we can kind of make do with this. Maybe even we should go back to being slaves in Egypt, because frankly, that seems like a better uh, um, option at the moment than stepping into the promise that God has for us, because that's going to cost us something, and we're not sure we want to pay that price. They settled for instant coffee. They missed the immeasurably more. To me, it is one of the saddest moments in the Bible. And you know, humanly, I can see why they wanted to settle. They'd traveled hard. It had been a hard journey to get there. They'd left their home. And they were kind of relatively comfortable. I mean, they weren't comfortable as they might be, but they were, uh, they were more comfortable than they were when they were kind of log- uh, you know, lugging stones and bricks around in, in Egypt. And I know in my own life, When God calls us into something new, it involves a cost. I used to like change until I settled. Isn't that true? For so many of us, we love change until we kind of get where we think we'd like to be and then any other change, it's like, no, thank you. It involves letting go. It involves having faith to see what isn't and laying hold of it. You know, God's promise in Isaiah, see, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? God is inviting you to a new thing. I can only speak for myself, but I don't want to be where I've already been and I don't want to stick with what I've already had. I, I want what he's doing now. In the words of uh, in Prince Caspian, there's this wonderful moment where they have been waiting for Aslan to come and kind of rescue them. and He doesn't show up. And eventually when he does show up, uh, Lucy, who's kind of like one of my favorite characters in literature, She says, oh, we thought you'd come like you came before. And he says, you know, I never come the same way twice. I never do things the same way twice. And often I wonder if we get stuck. You know, maybe some of you have been around where there's been, God's done incredible stuff. You know, and and the trick is to be thankful and to stay hungry for more because it it is unlikely that God is going to do what he's already done because he's about doing the new thing. Sometimes God puts a promise in front of us, and he asks us, he says, how much do you want this? And I feel for you as a church, you're at that moment, you're at this junction where God is putting a promise in front of you, of kind of a greater sense of his presence than you've experienced as a church before, a greater sense of his presence as you've experienced as individuals before, to see the manifest presence of God move among you and through you. Get ready for the poor to kind of knock you over on their way into church. He dangles these promises in front of us and he says, how much do you want these? Do you want these more than you want your reputation? Do you want these more than you want to feel comfortable? It's a really trivial example, but um, I was listening to this talk by this guy called Chris Vallotton and he was just sharing stories about how God had spoken to him and I was driving home and I I, I literally said in the car, Lord, I just, I just, and I felt like for me, God was, it was an invitation to me, like God was saying, how seriously do you want to hear my voice? So I was like, Lord, I just want, I will do whatever it takes. I'll look as stupid. I just want to hear your voice. I just don't want to care what anyone else thinks. And so then what happened is I pulled up the car and had to go and get some milk. Uh, It's like 10 o'clock at night. And I'm in Sainsbury's. Um, um, What happens is um, I'm at the checkout and God starts speaking to me about the person behind the counter which was, like, one, not convenient, and two, very embarrassing, because there was kind of a long queue of people. And what I've learned is, is uh, when we're not in the context of church, the best way to kind of uh, uh, work some of these things out is by, uh, by asking questions. So what happened was God said to me, she sings, she's a singer. So I said, I hope you don't mind me asking, are you a singer? And she said, yes. And, I, and then I, God said, she sings in a choir. So I said, so you sing in a choir, right? She goes, Yes. And, and then God says, she sings in a choir in a church. So I said, so you sing in a choir in a church. And by this stage, like her jaws on, on the floor, everyone in the queue is now staring at me. Uh, she starts crying. And I, and, and I said, well, I, I just feel like God wants to say this to you. And I just started sharing God's heart with her. But by the time I left, um, 
there's two people in the queue in tears, she's in tears, the manager's just standing there wondering what on earth's going on. Uh, I walk out like this happens to me all the time. Um, but you know, and I felt it was a really, but basically it came with God saying, are you prepared to step out? Are you prepared to take a risk? Are you prepared to ask a question? Because you are, you will see my manifest presence wherever you go, whatever you do, not just in church. And that is what God is promising you. If you are prepared to take hold of what God is promising you, if you're prepared to allow him to interrupt you, interrupt your plans, interrupt your day, interrupt your conversations. Do you want the presence of God more powerfully? Well, do you? Great. Well, some of you do. Are you ready as a church to step into the greater influence that he is going to give you? Because, you know, I want to tell you something. What happens when God starts to move and starts to shake like I believe he's going to? You're going to find that you're going to grow. Because people always want to be where God is and where God's doing something, where hope is rising. But I also want you to know this is going to be uncomfortable for some of you because I know how much you like the seat that you're sat in. So are you ready when the church starts to grow, when God starts to move, when, when you arrive at your seat that you've sat in for the last how many years and there's somebody else sat there? Are you ready for that? Will it be worth it? Because God is inviting, he's, he's asking you now. Do you want what I have for you? Are you going to falter? Are you going to hold back? Or are you going to step into it, swallow hard, take a deep breath, and, and, and step into it knowing that God is with you, that he's for you, that this is what he has for you in this season? I love Tim Hughes' song, Pocket Full of Faith. Um, I don't know if you, any of you have um, heard it. It's kind of, kind of been on repeat in, in our house for a little while. But there are these, just these lines I just want to read to you. I don't want to get there at the end of it all, looking behind me to see there was so much more. As individuals, do you want to stay in your own personal equivalent of Paran? Or do you want to step into the promise that God has for you? It is going to cost you. It's going to be uncomfortable. It's going to mean that God moves the furniture in your life in your circumstances, in your situation. But the alternative is staying where you've already been with what you already had when there's more. You know, some of you here, this is like music to your, your ears. You've been like, yes, I've been longing for this. I've been praying for this. This is what I want. If you're one of those people, like, you've got to keep, you've got to keep cheering. While well, everyone else is like, oh no, I can't, I've just got used to it. Just found, finally can get to my seat two weeks in a row. For others of you here, you know, life is a struggle. And the thought of taking hold of something new is just a little bit frightening. Or maybe there are some of you here, and you kind of like the idea of stepping into what God has for you as an individual and uh, you as a church. But the thing is, what happened is in the past, you felt like God has uh, called you to more and you've stepped out. And what you felt like was that he didn't come through for you. Or maybe you're here and uh, you know that God loves everybody else. You kind of know in theory that he loves you, but it's really difficult to accept that he loves you. <laughs> either because of stuff that you've done, or this is the important bit, or stuff that people have done to you. And what's happened is that you've disqualified yourself. I mean, you maybe make all the right noises, but internally you've disqualified yourself and you said, this, isn't, this is for everybody else, this isn't for me. Or maybe just the whole thought of any of this is just terrifying. And if you're being honest, this is kind of one of those talks. If you could, you'd get up and you'd walk out now and you'd you know, write it off as a strange man who came from Guildford and hope that you'd never see me again. <coughs> now, as I was talking to the Lord about this uh, the other day, he, he said to me, I'm not like Mr. Bumble. Uh, I was like, what? <laughs> who is Mr. Bumble? 
And he said, Mr. Bumble was an Oliver Twist. So then I remembered, like, I'd, I have to confess, I haven't read the book, but I have seen the musical. And, um, and he said, I'm not like Mr. Bumble. And you'll know what happens in Oliver. What happens is he's kind of egged on and he goes and he asks for more. When he gets asked for more, he gets shouted at. He has a song sung about him. And he's, he's uh, not a nice song. And he is punished and he's put into uh, this kind of cell and then he's sold as a worker. What I felt like God wanted to say to some of you tonight is I am not like that. That is not who I am. God is so good. He is so good. He loves you. He knows everything about you. And he has always loved you. In fact, what he says is he has his na- your name tattooed on his hand so that he would never forget you. He rejoices at every thought of you. He wants to draw close to you. He's not out to try and trick you or control you or manipulate you. He wants to give you life without measure. And I think for one person here, at least, God wants to say, and I'm not like your father either. I am not like your father. I just want that to sink in. For that one person, I am not like your father. And I know right now you've got a cold feeling shooting straight up your stomach and you're feeling all tight and you're feeling exposed. Well, I'm not interested in exposing you. I'm just interested in showing the heart of God for you. I am not like your father. You know, wherever you are on that continuum, what I'm learning is that the cost is always worth the reward. So as you as a church, as you as individuals, stand on the border of the promise. If you take God at his word, if you step out, if you trust him, you will look back and you will thank the day that you stepped out. Because he's not slow in keeping his promises. He wants to release faith. He wants to release get a greater sense of his presence. A faith that is more hungry for him. A faith that said we should go and we should take the land, whether it's your own private, personal, promised land or whether it's as a church. I want to finish by telling you a story real quick. Um, so when I worked at this, um, this church in London, I was responsible for, we had a 24-7 prayer room that kind of operated all the time, um, apart from a few weeks in the holidays. And so what happened was I was, um, I was tasked with going and sort of turning the lights on so that the person who came in uh, the following day on the Sunday, the kind of prayer room would be ready for them. And so I kind of went in on a Saturday, on my day off, um, and I went and turned the lights on. And, just, and I thought, I thought, you know what? Maybe I should just kind of like worship in here for a minute. Because um, th- then the next person who comes in, they won't come into a room that's kind of been empty and, and not used for the last couple of weeks. They'll come in and someone would have prayed and worshipped here in the last 24 hours. And maybe that'll make a difference. You know, because God promises that he inhabits the praises of people. And maybe, you know, it kind of echo around for a few hours while I'm not there, but in between. So what happens is I, I just put some worship on. I lock the door. Um, um, because we do get some sort of slightly interesting characters knocking on the door occasionally, so, um, or walking in. So I locked the door and I just started to worship. And what happened was, um, re- I-, I want you to know that I, I was doing it kind of because I thought I should. It wasn't like I had this, you know, I really wanted to go home and watch the football with my children. And what happened was, as I started to worship, is the manifest presence of God fell in that room. And, and what happened was, um, I was standing there as worshipping and, and as God started to pour out his presence, um, just my whole body started to shake. And, and then what happened was um, I felt these footsteps behind me. And I, I, I want you to know, if you've ever been locked in a prayer room uh, or anywhere and you think you're on your own and you feel footsteps behind you, it is a, a really a terrifying thing. And... Um, uh, but I just felt like I just got to engage with this. I knew nobody was in there, but, and I just, I, I just went with it. And what happened was I was simultaneously laughing and crying. I was completely overwhelmed by the sense of the presence of God. And these footsteps stopped just behind me. And then what happened was um, I felt this hand on my back, and I felt this other hand on my chest. And then what happened is this hand pushed through my chest. 
And when that happened, there was this explosion of life, kind of just this boom. Um, and, uh, and I just I kind of hit the floor, and I'm laughing, and I'm crying, and I don't know. It's really difficult to explain. The only way I can describe it is like this. If that, that um, you know, there's that um, bit in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe where uh, Lucy asks, what is Aslan like? And the answer is, oh, they say, is he safe? And Mr. Beaver, Mrs. Beaver, whoever it is, says, of course he's not safe, he's a lion. I felt, like, utterly terrified. But at the same time, I felt completely loved and utterly known. And then what happens is God just starts sharing his heart with me, for me, not for anybody else, but for me. I don't know quite how long that went on for. Eventually, I kind of receded, and I kind of you know, got up and moved into the next room, and the same thing happened again. I didn't feel the footsteps or anything, but the presence of God just fell, and I'm incapacitated on the floor, uh, kind of lost in wonder, love, praise, fear, the whole kind of mix. Because if God's present, it is amazing, but it is terrifying as well. We're not playing games here. You know, God is good, but he's, he's powerful. And you know what happened is that birth in me, just a longing. More than the, if you cut me open, what I would bleed is longing for people to encounter the person and the presence of Jesus. So I want to encourage you uh, tonight. I don't know where you are on this, on this journey. I want to encourage you that God is, there's this invitation for you. And if you allow him, he will bring you to that place of desperation and longing where all you want is more of him, regardless of what it costs. So why don't you stand? I'm going to invite the worship guys to come back.